This morning, of course, uh, as we celebrate a statesman of note that is being celebrated and revered and remembered uh, across the world. The Harambe Prosperity Plan has been uh, the, that was launched rather by President Hake King up with the goal of accelerating development and addressing inequality in Namibia. Each pillar of the plan uh, outlines specific targets and initiatives ranging from job creation and poverty reduction to improving education and healthcare services. Of course, as we know, the plan was also a part of a new way of uh, dealing with development by the president when they, of course, uh, advanced to the seat of head of state and also introduced at the same time what many people were referring to as the A-team of group of advisors that will assist him in implementing at an accelerated space of the development plans of the country. And one of them is joining me here in studio, responsible for uh, constitutional affairs as well as private sector interface, uh, Ms. Inge Zamaneka. A very good morning to you and thank you so much for making time out to join us today. Uh, thank you, Ricardo, and thank you for having me. Well, of course, it's uh, quite a somber and, and, and sad time for the country. And it's a very, very difficult question for me to ask, but uh, we have to start with that one. How did you, or the, did the news of uh, the president's passing reach you, and what were some of your uh, initial reactions to that news? No, thank you very much, Ricardo. Uh, the news of the uh, uncertain departure of, of President Hake G. Kenko uh, reached me in the early hours of the morning on Sunday. Uh, just a few minutes after 12, and it was really, I, I'm still struggling to process it. Uh, just like many other Namibians are also struggling to process it. Uh, the message to us that uh, we lost uh, Comrade President. And obviously in my panic and reaction, I said, how do you mean we lost him? He's in the hospital, isn't he? Then he said, no, I mean he's no more. And then I just said, no, uh, no, 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 no. You, there must be a mistake. So, you know, we, we are all processing this news uh, in different ways. And while we are trying as much as we can to move forward, we, we still can't believe it. And especially those I'm sure it's the same for the family. It's the same for those of us who had the privilege to work very closely with us, with him. Every day you go to the office, it's just remembrance of his presence. And yeah. he was such a, uh, 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 when you walk in, the presence is there. So I'm pretty sure you can feel that absence because he was such a larger than life personality. He was a prominent presence in that office. And, um, you hear him, you see him, you feel him everywhere as you, as, you, as you go into that office. And when he was not in the office, you also knew that he was not That's in the not office. office. Um, Let's take a step back uh, and, and really just focus on, in terms of obviously your relationship with him, uh, what, what were the initial encounters? When was the first time, uh, time, time you had met, even before you had started working for him? My uh, relationship with uh, uh, His Excellency Dr. Hake G. Genkop goes back many years. Mm. I met him first in 1976, um, 1978, when I came to the Institute of Namibia in Lusaka mm. as a student. And so that was my first encounter. And what I knew him then, his uh, presence, his um, uh, prominence is very much the same that I, I have experienced now when I went to work for him uh, many years later. And uh, during that time when we started with the institute, with the second intake, and uh, our English was pretty much uh, uh, non-existent, so to speak. Uh, so we knew a few words. Uh, good morning, say, how are you? Um, and so there was a, a favorite place where he used to pass and we knew that he would always pass there, either when he's coming from home or when he's going home. And so as students will congregate at that place, there was a wall, we'll be sitting there so that we can greet him and get engaged as he comes in or, or goes out. 
And so he will, on a Friday, he will ask us, so what are you guys doing here today? Then we'll say, ah, nothing. And then he'll say, okay, I'll send a bus so that he can collect you and, and you all come home. And we'll go that Friday and we'll come back on the Sunday. And so, you know, he was our director. And this is, this is obviously, it's not the kind of relationships that you see even nowadays, even in a corporate world, the director taking students of to course. his personal residence of course. for a whole weekend. Of course, yeah. You know, he knew that we were far away from home mm -hmm. and we, uh, most of us had no one else except uh, apart from our lecturers. Mm. And that culture was actually embedded in all the Namibian lecturers who were at the institute. So they, they embrace us as their own uh, children or family or relatives. So we always had a place to go to. One of, one of the things that, of course, many had mentioned, and I think the, the, the two, three conversations I'd had, particularly with regards to uh, 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 union was they were saying that he was very uh, hands-on but also at the same time willing to share information like it, it wasn't he was excited to to share wisdom to share information and to empower um, what, what was your experience during the time also and you know, particularly that aspect of you know the sharing the empowering and making sure that it develops that relationship with 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 young people he was, um, of course, as a director, he was not uh, daily in the class lecturing. Mm. Uh, he was overseeing all the other lecturers. Mm. But uh, he made sure that uh, every uh, encounter that we had with him, mm. he uses his, as an opportunity uh, to teach us one or two things. Uh, we used to have classes, though, during the weekend uh, in political science. And uh, on, on occasions, he will be leading those uh, discussions himself. Mm. And um, he taught us the English that we speak today. Um, he will stop when you make a mistake and correct you. And the next day he will say, I hope you have learned from what I told you yesterday. And so he was always uh, very much hands on. Uh, he was always looking forward to have us become empowered and uh, able to progress uh, to the next level. So every opportunity was a learning opportunity. And it was true then, and it is even true now, as, 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 as advisors when we were working with him. Every interaction and every uh, meeting, and those, there were many meetings every day, and it was the same opportunity that uh, he will test you and he will stress you. Uh, even if you had an opinion on something and you have submitted a paper or something, you want to make sure that you know what you're talking about. So he will be questioning you from all So, so he'll be testing your confidence in the information in or the proposal information that, you're that you are giving him. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. I, I understand, of course, that uh, he, he was sort of, it was never the middle ground. If, if you've done something good, you will be commended at the highest level. Yeah. But if you are fumbling around here, you, can't, you might also get one of those famous tongue lashings. Precisely, precisely. And I think that's how empowering he was because a person who corrects you actually helps you to become better tomorrow. Mm. And he used to tell us his own experiences when he started in the United Nations Secretariat. He said he had a very tough boss, uh, McBride, and uh, whenever he had to do something for his boss, McBride, he would really do a thorough job. And when he, 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 he submitted, he will be subjected to all kinds of scrutiny and questioning, and he will think, oh my goodness, I have now not lived up to expectations here. And then later his boss will say, oh, well done. This is really, it's a, it's a good outcome here. I, I'm glad you are growing. I guess so he learned that that is how you empower people, stretch them, give them uh, serious assignments, and then uh, make sure that uh, you are there to coach them and to monitor them and not just to push them down and, and leave them there. Make sure you push them as hard as possible and when they do something good, you also commend them and you lift them up. So that is the kind of a person he was. I want, I want us to move uh, and focus a little bit, of course, on, because uh, we know you've also been part of the public life and public service for quite some time. Yes. Um, that transition now from, from stepping out of, I mean, the corporate level at the highest level in, in, in corporate Namibia, that's where you were finding yourself. Mm -hmm. And now you are 
being asked to come and serve public service. Of course, the dichotomy, it's, it's two different mm -hmm. worlds we're talking about. How did that uh, conversation come about? Was it a, a phone call? Is it something that happened over time? How did that transition for you take place where he reached out to you and said, listen, I need you to be part of, mm -hmm. part of this team? Remember, there were so many expectations, mm -hmm. particularly when he took over in 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, reflect on that a bit. How, how did that mm -hmm. um, happen? So uh, when I was at Namdeb, already I was thinking of uh, uh, other options uh, moving out. I was the longest serving CEO of Namdeb and I have gone through it all. And I felt at the time that it was important for me to step out so that somebody else can come in and, and, and move forward with the organization. There was a time when it was um, almost indistinguishable between Namdeb and Inge. And I thought, no, 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 this is not right. <laughs> Uh, we two separate entities, and, and if I become so much involved that I feel Namdeb is me and Namdeb is Inge, then it's a danger. So I already made that conscious decision to move on. And so the, the, the word maybe reached him that I was considering various options. And so he called me and he said, well, I, I hear this and that, uh, but uh, you must remember who brought you where you are there, the training that you have. And so if you have finished serving in that area where you have been assigned, it's time to come back and serve in the, in the, in the public sector. Mm -hmm. So I, I thought over it and I said, well, I, I'm, I'm willing to consider. And then I was given a specific time for an appointment. Mm -hmm. And obviously when I went there, it was... Uh, natural that uh, I will accept to come back to the public service because I started off my career back home when I came back as a public servant in the Ministry of Mines and Energy. Mm. So it was an, a, 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 an easy transition to go back to the public service. But what was challenging was uh, the fact that previously I was the boss and yeah. I was the decision maker and everything stops the, the, with the me. The buck stops, the buck with, stops you. with me. Yeah. Uh, but here I soon recognize that uh, this is somebody else's space. I'm here to advise and to support and to assist and to make sure that he succeeds in his programs and his vision. So I quickly, consciously just decided that I will do what I can to make sure that the president succeeds, that he achieve the result that he has set for himself and we remain in the, in the background. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about just the thinking um, about the president, because remember when, when those appointments came, the caliber of the individuals, of course, uh, yourself coming from, from, coming from NAMDEP, uh, the industries, highly regulated, governance, those are the, the cornerstones. You find the likes of uh, Albertus Ahumo as, as press secretary, of course, mm -hmm. director general at the NBC, mm -hmm. uh, John Stakler. So when the team was put together, of course, there was a the questions from the public side as well. Of, how is this going to work? How, what are they going to get paid? Is the managing director? We don't have the tears to accommodate you, etc., mm -hmm. etc. Et but he came out and he said, "Look, these are my people. They're going to support me. Mm -hmm. This is the A team. Mm -hmm. That's how you how he coined it." Mm -hmm. Talk to us around the, the thinking that he had behind bringing you together from mm -hmm. the highest level of, of, of yeah. the private and SOE sector and what really the thinking was around uh, putting this team together beh behind him. Yeah, so uh, President Kane um, was one of the uh, executives with, with government who had uh, uh, a lot of interaction with the business community, mm -hmm. especially in his role as uh, Minister of Trade and Industry and previously as Prime Minister, having set the um, governance architecture. Uh, when he became president, he came up with this very highly ambitious program, uh, the HPP, which was meant as an accelerator to the NDPs. And therefore he needed a team of people who can come and hit the ground running as it were. And so he picked a team of people that he believed based on their experience and the knowledge and uh, especially the culture within the private sector focus on, on performance management, on delivering results that will help him to achieve that. But uh, it was made very clear that uh, this is a sacrifice that you are making. You are not going to, to be uh, paid based on your previous um, uh, income from where you are coming from. You will be coming 
and you'll be put on the government scale. So there was no expectation for us that we're going to receive the same benefits or, or, or remuneration, contrary to the perception that, that, that were out there. And so we're happy to come and serve. And uh, we then started off with the crafting of HPP. And uh, HPP was actually informed by the programs that were already in the NDPs. The, the, the development plan. The yeah. development plan. And so we wanted to say, out of the projects that are already planned, uh, which are the ones that have a potential to move the needle in terms of economic development, in terms of infrastructure development, and uh, what are the bottlenecks currently. And if we elevate them to the presidential plan, which is a HPP, mm -hmm then with, a, uh, with his personal focus and, 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 and priority on those programs, uh, the allocation of resources were going to be uh, much better. The focus in terms of monitoring and evaluation because it's he much now has streamlined. In streamlined and mm -hmm. he has direct view of what is happening to his plan. And mm -hmm. so that was the idea that, that brought up HPP. And if you look in all the pillars, all those programs or most of them were already in the uh, NDP4, mm -hmm. and NDP4 was coming to an end. So there was this uh, period of lag between N NDP4 four and, five, yeah. and five. Mm -hmm. And so we say let it, HPP should then address that gap, uh, and it should also prioritize and accelerate those programs that are likely to move the needle in terms of his vision mm -hmm. and uh, promises to the, to the electorates. Mm -hmm. Part of, of course, the responsibility, and if, even if I look at the, the, how the, 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 the team was constructed as well, of course, you know, the press secretary, economic advice, but then you speak about uh, private sector interface, but before that, constitutional affairs. Mm -hmm. And the many people, I'm pretty sure, are not also aware of your legal background as well mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in terms of school. And the, the, the reason why I'm bringing this in is just that, that nexus of deliberately having constitutional affairs there mm -hmm. and how he ran his administration mm -hmm. on a always follow the policy, always mm -hmm. follow the law. Yeah. Reflect on that a little bit, on Hage Kengo as the man behind the respect for the rule of law and that constitution. Yes, uh, President Kengo was the, uh, the architecture of uh, our constitution. Mm -hmm. And so he knows very well the need to respect the rule of law and uh, ensure that there's a separation between the various organs of state. Mm. And so when he was uh, conceptualizing the support staff with, within mm. his office, he, 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 he was very pretty much aware that a lot of the work that will come in there will have to do with constitutional mm. uh, powers that he has to exercise mm. and therefore he has to have somebody that can help him in terms of making sure that that part of his functions uh, 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 perform uh, properly. Of course, the Attorney General is the principal legal advisor to the President yeah. and to the Government of the Republic of Namibia. Yeah. My role as advisor on constitutional affairs is on the day-to-day -day issues regarding the Constitution, when he has to appoint um, constitutional ap appointments, appointments yeah. uh, which is the correct reference that you, you, you take when his decisions are taken, what is the next step in terms of proclamation, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, just making sure that things are done when sonar has to be delivered, what are the issues that has to go in that sonar. So it, it is purely looking at from a day-to-day -day running of that office on the constitutional um, uh, mandate of the president. And of course, whatever I do, I make sure I do it in consultation with the Attorney General and where necessary also with the Minister of Justice. Mm -hmm. So there has never been any confusion mm -hmm. uh, as far as I'm concerned who the actual uh, legal principal advisor to the president is. Mm -hmm. But in, in running the office on a day-to-day -to -day, to -day basis, I was responsible for those functions. And, and, and during, during, during the time, of course, we know that there were some uh, amendments to the Constitution as well, particularly the biggest one. And uh, I don't know, do you call it fate? Do you call it foresight? The discussion around having a VP was one of the big ones when those amendments were, 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 were brought to the public. 
And uh, consistently, of course, there was a talk around, we don't want to leave any power vacuum, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm pretty sure, I mean, none of us envisioned that we would have to bury a sitting president. And alas, after the, 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 the amendments were made now, we are seeing that those very amendments were the bedrock of the smooth transition that was hailed on Sunday globally. Uh, reflect a little bit on the, the, the time during when, when those uh, amendments were taking place. And, you know, the thinking, it, obviously the fact that it was such a huge issue for public, but now the way it played out at the end of the day, we are all grateful that eventually it did happen. Just reflect a bit on that time for us. With the benefit of hindsight, mm -hmm. um, President Kainko is a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a visionary leader, mm -hmm. no doubt. Um, it, it, uh, according to the, princip the habits of uh, highly effective people, the mm -hmm. second principle by Stephen Coffey mm -hmm. is that you must start with the end in mind. And now looking back at all what has happened, mm -hmm. clearly President Kane Cobb was building uh, the future. Mm -hmm. What will happen when he's not there? And he was always saying, we must make sure we embed the system, processes, and institution. Mm -hmm. I'm not a president of presidentialism. I'm a constitutionalist. I want to make sure that things happen even when I'm not here. So that point was really emphasized. Now imagine if the fateful Sunday event would have happened. Of course, there was still succession uh, mechanism in the previous amendment, uh, but it would have uh, been another process to get that to, to take place. So, with the amendment of the constitution and the uh, inclusion of a vice president in, in, in the new amendments, mm. the transition was much more smoother in, than otherwise it would have been. So whatever President Kainko did, he did it with a future in mind. Mm. And it was not about him, but about the nation and, and, and the stability and the peace of the country. And how would it be if he is not there? He didn't want to be a person where when he's not there, everything stops. And that's why when he ever he was traveling, he would sometimes call the office. And if you are not where you are supposed to be at that time, he will say, so when I'm not there, everything stops. He said, no, 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 Your Excellency. Everything is still running. We just were at another place for another reason. But the office is definitely still functioning. So he was always looking forward and making sure that uh, the systems runs when he's not there. The processes, everybody know what needs to be done mm -hmm. and that the institutions are very clearly defined and everybody knew what, what must be done. In terms of that, of course, as, as, as we are now coming uh, more towards the, you know, implementation, not only just the implementation of HPP1, but from moving from HPP1 to, 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 to HPP2, it's an accelerated plan, and we've seen some of the results that have come out from this as well. One of the questions and, and, uh, that I wanted to put to you was the, the thinking behind the planning, because we know generally with, with central government, it's, you know, it takes the bureaucratic processes, et cetera, can really, really slow uh, things down. But what we have seen after he had taken over as president was, I don't want to say corporatizing certain aspects of the office, but changing the way in which you're planning with HPPP accelerated plan, let's, let's take down from, if you have a strategic plan for a company, you would say, yeah. let's focus on two, three things for this year. Yeah. That way we know we can be able to mm. measure that effectively as well. Yeah. Talk to us about just the, the, the philosophical posturing and the thinking in mindset in terms of how we're supposed to run government, perhaps tying in with his legacy. Yeah, so uh, President Kainkov always had two things to say about uh, performance. Mm. You are effective, you must be effective and efficient at the same time. Mm. So he wanted to make sure that the performance uh, management system within government mm. uh, was um, improved to make sure that uh, people knew what needs to be done mm. and uh, the outcomes of what needed to be done had impacts mm. on the life of the people. So if you look at the construction of HPP, uh, it has got five pillars. And those five pillars really speaks to the bread and butter issues of, um, of, of the Republic. So the first pillar is uh, effective governance. And under effective governance is where you 
have the system processes and institution where you have the performance management, where you have the policy, the legal framework. That is the foundation. And then you have the uh, economic advancement pillar. Mm -hmm. And that is now where the bread and butter issues, the growth, um, the, the, the ensuring that um, industries are developed and ensuring that the growth that we are experiencing has an impact, mm -hmm. is inclusive and is impacting the ordinary men and women on the street. And then you have the social progression. Social progression is about socio social development, where you have all the sectors of health, poverty, housing, and uh, youth, and all the sports issues. Those are all in that particular pillar. How do we progress socially as a nation? And then, of course, infrastructure development, making sure that the infrastructure is in place, and international cooperation is critical for us because we don't live in a vacuum. We are part of the global village. So it was deliberately um, designed to make sure that we touch on the key issues that uh, affects our society. Mm. And uh, when we look back to the implementation, when we started with the implementation of the HPP in the first term, unfortunately, it was also the time when there were so many um, independent uh, variables mm. Mm. Uh, that were outside of our control. We had the longest, severest drought at the same time. Mm. We had the uh, uh, global commodity crisis almost uh, hitting uh, the floor. And then we had the COVID coming during that time. But we have also, during that time, we issued a detailed accountability report that uh, reported the progress of what we have done. And if you look at that report, clearly you pick out uh, the flagships of the programs that were done. Then come second term, we say, let's continue. We can't just leave HPP in term one. It's, a, it's an ongoing, it's a continuation of the legacy. And so we came back with um, HPP2. HPP two, mm. And we tried to focus on those programs that were not achieved in, in the first HPP. And we are what we decided to do this time around is also to bring a performance delivery unit that helps us to track on weekly basis, monthly basis, the progress of what is being done and report. Because if you track progress and you are not reporting, the policy makers and the decision makers need to know what are the obstacles, why we are not achieving what we are supposed to achieve. But if you look at HPP2 now, you will hear from my colleague later, I believe, uh, James, in, uh, after this program, mm. and he will um, outline to you the significant achievements that we have made in terms of the goals of the economic advancement pillar, uh, green hydrogen being one of them, and of course many other projects that he will speak about. And so I think it is not um, the perception that the HPP2 have uh, not achieved the result. It's actually maybe people who are far from, from uh, the engine room and who don't know what is happening. We are reporting on monthly basis. We are monitoring progress. And obviously, where possible, we are trying to address. But the, the greatest constraint to us achieving uh, some of those projects is the financial resource. We all know that it's only now that the economy is beginning to pick up and therefore that will impact positively on the government revenue. And the last statement that President Kane Cobb made uh, in January in his uh, New Year speech was that uh, we are leaving the country, we are saving and we are leaving the country in good hands. And if you look at, at it now in, with hindsight, he was really prophetic that uh, indeed he's leaving the country is in good hands. If you look at the tra transition that took place on, on Sunday, and if you look at the uh, economic uh, green shoots that are visible now, if you look at the improved investments that are flowing through the country. And, and what is just in the pipeline, I think there's yes. just also just a, a considerable amount of sense of hope with yes. everything that has been happening, particularly yes. in the last two years, when yes. we're talking about the green hydrogen, yes. these oil discoveries, yes. et cetera, et cetera. And uh, mm. finally, I think if we look at what has been happening in Venduk uh, for the last couple of days since his passing, the rainfall has just been um, 
uh, incredible. Mm. And uh, this rainfall, uh, it was predicted to be probably one of the worst one, uh, but uh, we are seeing now that uh, in most parts of the country, people are beginning to plow and, and to plant. So we're really hoping uh, his uh, untimely passing will have uh, at least Mm. close some of the difficulties that we have had uh, over the, the, the beginning of this year. It is regrettable that we speak of him in past tense. We still cannot process that we have to speak of him in the past tense, mm. uh, but uh, over time that's what it is and we, we hope and pray that we can continue moving forward to ensure that his legacy continue. Thank you very much. I, I, I was going to ask, how do you want him to be remembered? But I think you've laid that out for us. Uh, my condolences once again. We know, of course, you had spent on a daily basis uh, working together with him. Uh, and I think collectively as a nation, we are thankful for your ability to balance continuing with the work while you're also mourning somebody who had spent so much time with you on a daily basis. Thank you. Inge Zamone Kami. Of course, are reflecting on the relationship with the president and, of course, the thinking, the philosophical underpinnings around how he had put uh, the, the support and advisors around him that helped propel HPP1 and HPP2 and brought us to where we are right now, where we are looking at a significant economic injection in our country over the next couple of years. Stay with us. We continue celebrating the great statesman, the great administrator, Dr. Hageji Kengo. <laughs>